follow through. If you've ever played a sport, you've probably heard that simple secret for improving your performance. You have to follow through. I can, I can picture just about every coach who's ever had any contact with me in any way saying the same thing. I mean, I've, I've been coached by all kinds of, of great athletes. That didn't make me a great athlete, but it made me a better one. Uh, I can remember a single afternoon spent with a major league baseball uh, player, and he took me out to a batting cage, and I was just like whiff, 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 whiff. I was playing wiffle ball, but not on purpose. And it was just, you know, fanning every one of them. And, and he gave me just some simple coaching, some simple advice, and I remember him saying, you have to follow through. Your stroke has to follow through all the way. Don't just stop when it, right there, everything's a bunt with you, you know, and stuff like that. So in that, I actually, my, my percentage went up dramatically. I think I got, you know, a piece of at least half of the balls at the same speed, just simply from that little piece of advice. You've got to follow through. And it's one of the keys to hitting a home run. I understand. I never did. But um, if you're going to, you probably need to follow through. And whether it's football or basketball or even dodgeball, um, you have to follow through. And I think golf is one of those things. I, I was never much of a golfer. I, I could uh, putt-putt was about it, you know, or goofy golf or whatever they call it, you know, but the, the kind where you're just putting. But even that, you have to kind of follow your swing through. But golf swings, I know people are just simply obsessed with proper follow through. And it's what happens after you hit the ball that's just as important or more important even than what happens before. And that seems kind of strange in some ways. But let me read the dictionary definition of what follow through is. This is what it says. The concluding part of a sports stroke after a ball or other object has been hit or released. And when you think about that, again, a visual example could help. Um, you know, tennis. Um, I tried to pick a sport I was good at and I wasn't at any. So I, I was like, well, I don't know if there's follow through in skateboarding. I used to be okay at that. But, you know, when you fall, follow through, you know, or whatever. But tennis, I was never any good at tennis. But I got better when Lynn, who was good at tennis, gave me that little ten tennis tip, which was about follow through. She said, you know what you do? You hit the ball and you stop. You have this like very choked kind of way of hitting the ball and I would try to hit as hard as I could but I didn't have this thing where you know where it swings all the way around and all that and so she said you're always you know choking your stroke there's no power there's no accuracy there's no consistency and I'm like yeah I get it um, but you know but following that through you know there was only I, I don't want to go down too much of a tangent, but I have to brag for just a moment. I beat her one time. Um, she will give you all the reasons why. One was it was the flu game. You know the famous flu game with Michael Jordan where he like put up massive points? Well, um, Lynn, Lynn was having very sick one day, and I made her play anyway. I'm like, you got to follow through with your commitment, you know? And so she's, she's dying on the court, and I just took advantage of that moment. And she gave me what's called the... the uh, doubles line so like I had singles line meaning that she had a much narrower court to hit for me and I had this like wide open court for her and again she's just sweating and feeling terrible and I and I did finally beat her at tennis that one time and that was about it so um just wanted to I think we didn't play much after that but but um just again letting you know that what happens after contact is just as important as what happens before and I actually as a as a sort of person who likes to at least think I have an analytical mind, I like to ask myself why. I mean, how can it be that something that happens after the ball's already gone actually matters? Like whether it's, you know, bowling or whatever and people put the English on it and all that. That's not what it's talking about. It's really the before and after can't be separated as clearly as we do. We tend to think, okay, I hit the ball, I'm done. But there are two parts of really a, a whole action and correct form requires completed action. Again, um, knowing that you're going to go all the way around fluidly through a motion actually affects what happens before. And so there, it's actually a completed stroke. And so it isn't just that you're randomly doing something, you know, after the, the ball has been hit or the ball has been thrown or any of that. It's this fluid motion that is a really one complete thought. And so when you think about that, the result, again, is power and accuracy and consistency. And so follow through is very important in the sports world, but it's even more important in the spiritual world. And I think one of the reasons that we 
uh, like sports analogies, even, uh, you know, when we're using different thoughts and coaching and stuff like that, is because things that are so true in one place are true somewhere else as well. And, and, and you can put it in the physical and then you can transfer it over and follow through to the spiritual. And again, I've learned many, many lessons in my life just simply by someone saying, well, this spiritual thought is a lot like this physical thought. Now, hmm, yeah, there's a lot to be said for that. And so today we're looking at 2 Corinthians 8, and you can picture Paul kind of with the little whistle around his neck, you know, and he's, he's coaching the Christians in Corinth, right? He's, he's wanting to win, not a game, but for them to win the game of life, for them to, to truly up their game, so to speak. And I don't know if that's a desire you have, but in my life, I love to get better at stuff. I hate getting worse at anything. Like the more and more I, I, I go along in life, anything that I used to be better at, it actually kind of bothers me to think, man, I used to be pretty good at this. I'm terrible now. Uh, or I'm getting worse, you know, and practice is making worse or something like that. That would be very, very frustrating. I even had somebody tell me the other day, I worked so hard and I didn't do better. And you're like, man, that is a very frustrating thought if it's true. But so rarely is that true, that you could work on something and work on something. You might take a temporary dip, but the bottom line is if you are consistently practicing something right and following through on it, well, it just has a way of leading to the right results. And so if you think about this, Paul was counseling them, again, to complete their commitments, to perform their promises, to make good on their vows, and to take their verbal vows and turn them into actual action, which is, again, one of the toughest things to do in life, to follow things through from start to finish. I think starting things is really easy. Um, you can start all kinds of stuff. I always have people who come to me with, with ideas and they're thinking, I'm going to start a business. And you're like, well, that's pretty easy. Um, starting a business is simple. Anyone can start a business. I mean, you could do all these online things with like 49 bucks and self-incorporate and by the end of the day, hey, I started a business. And then you go, well, now what? I don't know. Uh, well, you, you got to follow through with that and do some stuff with that. You know, and, ooh, that's a lot different. It's pretty easy to start a relationship. Hey, I'm starting a relationship. You know, you just, um, let's go out. Okay, good. <laughs> that's all there is to that. And you go, well, I don't know about that. There's a lot about follow through. And I think one of the areas that follow through is particularly difficult can be in financial areas. And as you'll soon see, this is what the next two chapters are about. They're very direct on that idea. And some people would think, oh, man, Scott is so smart. He's so sneaky. I know what he's doing. End of the year. Um, I even had a pastor the other day tell me, oh, you got to do an end of the year giving message. That's when all the giving is. And I said, oh, well, I'm not going to do that, but okay. But um, I wish I was that smart, but I'm not that smart. But God's smart. And one of the things that I think about this is he planned this chapter at a time of year when one year's ending and another's about to begin. And you say, well, what is follow through all about? And that I would say that though money will be mentioned in today's message, it's really not the point that I want to make. The point that I want to make is money's, if you can get money right, you can get other things right. See, I think about Jesus, one of the things he said is money's the least of things. I mean, I love the fact that he said, if you can't deal with filthy lucre, I don't know you know, if you've ever thought of the word lucre, but that's a good King James one, but it, it's lucre, you know, and you go lucrative is from that same thing. But anyway, um, filthy, he's like, wash your hands after you touch it. Don't eat after you, you know, if you work at a restaurant, you're not supposed to use the, the till and go back and use the grill. Why? Because uh, <laughs> it, it, it's passed through a lot of hands, right? It's like kind of nasty money. People keep it in their sweaty little palm and stuff. So anyway, I'm telling you that because Jesus said, that's the least of stuff. I'm not talking about that. He would often use money as a thought to say, here's something you all understand, but let me give you something maybe you don't all understand, which is the spiritual implications of a lot of that stuff. And so again, I think a lot of times people get hung up on the actual money part of it and miss the principle, which is so much huger. It's so much more important. So here's the thought as I go through this, which is it's important to follow through on commitments that we make. If we make a commitment, it's, it's easy to make a promise. I could promise, hey, I'll give you a million bucks. 
But to perform that promise, whoa, that's a whole different thing. You know, I, I have seen over the years in, in different organizations and different places that people pledge all kinds of stuff. But it's always like, even a bank will say, are those pledges or are those gifts? You know, because those are different because even the banker knows everybody pledges. I mean, pledge is just a spray that you put on furniture. Um, you know, that, that doesn't mean anything, you know. It's easy to pledge. People get excited in a moment. And, ah, I'll do it, you know. I was saying the other day, if I go to an auction, I'm the kind of guy who could get so excited. There was a Volkswagen uh, bus that that auctioned off at two hundred and seven thousand dollars the other day um this was a little rarer model than i have but uh, but it's it's one i like i used to have len knows this and i was like <laughs> but if i'd been sitting at that thing i would have been sitting with len and i'd gone two hundred two hundred thousand you know and i go you don't have two hundred thousand i know i got excited um I, I just wanted it and i'm like i hope someone bids 201 because uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm in serious trouble if i I can't follow through with this commitment. I just got excited. And so I think about this. Spiritually speaking, learning to follow through faithfully will affect every relationship you have with family, with friends. It'll affect any ministry God calls you to in any way. And every person has a ministry, you know, um, maybe more than one. I, I look at people who have all kinds of different things that they're doing. And ministries are not confined to church walls, right? They, they take place so often outside of that. Uh, it'll affect your marriage for sure if you have one or if you ever want one. Um, it'll, it'll affect your workplace for sure. Um, it's, it's got profound personal implications too on things that I even promised myself. Where I won't do that again and then I don't follow through with that promise not to do that again or something like that. So learning this. And learning to live with accuracy and consistency and power, these are the things that come from follow through, right? And, and if we fail to follow through, we can have all kinds of good intentions, but nothing to show for it in the end. And so, again, I wouldn't want that to happen to anyone. God doesn't want that to happen to anyone. So let's look at 2 Corinthians 8 and see what it has to say. It says this, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Now that, ooh, that's a tongue twister. There's a lot in that. But there's four principles that I pulled out of this chapter that I think will help every one of us follow through. And again, please for a moment, just forget that the, the ID he's talking about is financial because if that's all someone gets away with, they're like, all right, I'll pay that person the $10 I told her I'd give them. That would be the smallest of all matters that could come out of this chapter. So get that one right, but don't get this wrong, which is that the first principle is that giving follows getting. This is a really cool thought and there's a circularity to these things because they're so connected because I could have just as well said getting follows giving <laughs> because there's a circularity again there's a connection between them it's a big flow through all of this but the principle number one again for spiritual follow-through is that giving follows getting because the first thing someone has to get is they have to get it and when I say get it I'm talking about like the why behind the what Getting God's grace is really an important thing in life. See, no matter what else I get, I got to get this before I give anything. Four times in the first nine verses, the word grace is mentioned in connection with generosity. I mean, he just says grace, 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 grace. What is grace? Grace is getting something you don't deserve, right? When I come to see what I don't deserve that I got from God, well, it, it should in some way unleash a generous heart in me. But until I get that, I'm going to always have trouble giving anything. I'm going to have trouble giving grace to people. Oh, I'm not going to give grace to people. That person doesn't deserve this. They deserve judgment. And you're like, like I do? Oops. You know, again, you have to get in order to give. So giving follows getting. You got to get first. Getting generosity. Getting generous things. I think of grace. I defined it this way for today, which is generous getting generous getting it's actually getting from god generously and having a flow of god and his characteristics into my life and until i do that i will be unable really i will have nothing to give even if i wanted to 
So even if I could get the willingness part right, the ability really, I don't have any mercy to give because I don't know what it is to get it. I don't have an example of it. If you look at our world today, you're really not going to see grace, mercy, peace, joy. These are not the things that are out there in abundance. You can't, you can't find them very easily, but you can find them easily and abundantly in God. He follows through with his promise and he is a giver by nature right? And so grace is undeserved, unmerited favor. Coming into contact with Christ is to say, I've got it. I'm a, I am got it. I got the gift. I'm a generous getter. I have gotten more than I deserve. Now what do I do? Well, follow through. What's the natural and supernatural outflow of that? Well, it's that giving follows getting. And remember the analogy, there's a part that comes before and a part that comes after. And I think if you get these wrong, uh, you'll be at best a guilty giver or a kind of, you know, scroogey giver, if I could put it that way, you know, or, or grinchy giver. Uh, and, and when you think about it, it's, it's like getting grace means you don't, you don't do things out of guilt. You don't do things out of pressure. My wife knows I have walked away from amazing deals because of the hard sell. Uh, the moment a, a salesperson puts the hard sell on me, I'm like, sorry, that's an amazing deal, but I'm not taking it on principle. I, I, don't, I don't like being manipulated. I don't like being pressured. So I'm going to go somewhere else. I may even pay more, but I'm going to pay more with my mind clear. Uh, rather than you saying, three, four, two, three, two, one, you got to do it now. You know, and they have these timers on everything now. And it's like, this bargain's going to go if you don't do it in the next three minutes. I'm like, I'm not going to do it. But if you try to give or live without first getting grace, it won't work. You won't have anything to give. You'll, you'll run out so quickly. And again, this principle goes so far beyond the financial. Again, first we get from God. There's people who think that you, you give to get. Like, okay, God, do you see me being generous down here? Now open the floodgates. You promised all this stuff. And he goes, I, there, it's never like that. You still don't get it. <laughs> Generous getting is, I get generously whether I give or not. That's, that's God saying, grace, grace, I just, I just give. I just give because I'm a giver. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, those are just who I am. And again, we have that idea, I know, we've been in gift exchanges where it's like, oh no, I gotta get something, something for this person because they got something from that person. But again, when you think about it relationship-wise, it's not what it's meant to be. It's meant to be a follow-through. That it's just, it just makes sense, man, that God gives and, and, and I, I get and, and I give and, and God gives and I get. And it's just a flow through a person's life. The rest of the spiritual stroke, once you get grace, you're going to give grace. And it's one of the surest signs, I think, that somebody gets it. When I see a grace giver, I know for sure that person gets it. They must have gotten it. They got it from somewhere. They didn't learn it in this world. Uh, they got it from somewhere outside of this economy, right? That somebody would say, well, why are they so generous of spirit? And again, I, when I think of generosity, it's one of the key words we put on our, um, our mission statement as a church. And the reason is I just have been the recipient of gracious gift people, people who are just like, Generous of spirit. Again, it wasn't a check they wrote. It was a not a check mark they put off on some list somewhere. It was just simply who they were. And I was like, that's who I want to be. That's how I want to be. I want to be one of those kind of people. Not somebody who's got a, a balance sheet somewhere that I'm like, well, wait a minute. Let's see. Did, did we overgive in that case or undergive? <sighs> you know what? God has given so much. Let's just be generous and see where it lands. See, the rest of the spiritual stroke, <laughs> again, it just kind of follows through and it flows through. And one reason Paul was visiting the various churches was to gather an offering that was for the needy in Jerusalem. But here's what's interesting about it. He was talking to Gentiles about a contribution for Jews. Now, again, you might say, well, I don't, I'm not sure I understand why that's a big deal. Well, it's a huge deal because this was heathens, quote unquote, recent converts helping out people who the very foundations of their faith had flown through this. And this was an animosity that went so incredibly deep. These would have been people who said, help the Jews. When did they ever help us? 
right? I mean, this it would have been one of those things. It, it would have been a very easy thing for them to point back to years and decades and centuries of hatred between these groups and said, why would I help them? I might help my own, but I'm not helping them. And you think about this, Paul was bridging an amazing gap here, an amazing gap, where there were people saying, you know what? My faith causes me, because I'm a generous getter, I'm going to be a generous giver, just because. And you look at verse 2, Paul tells the Corinth church that what was going on with their neighbors to the north, Macedonia, you know... This could be misconstrued. Maybe maybe Paul was one of these guys who's kind of like, hey, we've got two groups, and this group's going to, we got spirit. Yes, we do. We've got spirit. How about you? You know, but the Macedonians, he was kind of doing this. I don't know about you, but there's nothing like a tiny bit of understanding of what other people do to make you go. Again, I'm not for those kind of fundraiser competitions where it's like you know it's the boys versus the girls or it's the ninth grade versus the tenth grade but it's amazing how much that can actually motivate people and when i think about it sometimes i'm like man what if just cooperation motivated me as much as competition competition can motivate people all kinds of stuff but what if it was just plain old Hey, look, the Macedonians are following through. I mean, he's kind of saying, that, you know what? They promised, but they actually performed it. I'm just letting you know. Look at their stroke. It was from promise all the way to fulfillment. And look what God is doing in Macedonia. Look at all the things that's going on there. They are grace getters. They were grace givers, and they follow through in spite of their own challenges. See, this is interesting because he says in verse 2, great trial of affliction, deep poverty. What was it? It was people. It wasn't the generous being limited only to people who had lots to spare. I don't know if you've noticed this, but it's kind of interesting. They, they put little things like this on the Internet, and you know everything on the Internet's true, right? But one of the things they have, I noticed it one day, it was... Famous celebrities who are infamous bad tippers. Um, you know, they're people who just like super, super loaded. And they'll stiff the waiter on the tip. And you go, nice. Not just once for bad service. Just plain old, hey, serve me. I have money. I don't have to tip. I got, you know, I gave you, uh, meeting me was your tip. You know, and you're like, Wow. Could I, that won't pay my rent, you know? And you think about this, and then there's these other cases where you have somebody, I, I read one the other day, and they always come around around, uh, you know, this time of year, some good news for a change, but where somebody who's a former waitress or something and who really is still not that wealthy, but they leave like a big tip to a waitress at a place, and they're like, 500 bucks on a $17 bill. What? Why? And it was just, I remember what it was to be that. And I saw you trying to juggle your two kids in the kitchen and doing all this stuff. And you know what? You need the 500 worse than I do. And you go, see, it, this is what he's saying. The grace of God bestowed upon a person, it doesn't necessarily mean that that person has more than everyone else. They might even have less and give out of their less. And one of the surest signs, again, that someone has embraced God's grace is they become a giver, not just financially, but in every way, in every way. Because you know what? Checks can be easy to write sometimes. But I think harder things is to spend energy on something, to spend emotional investment in something. That's a generous heart, too. A person who says, oh, my time? Well, I've, I don't have much time, but... I will spend an hour of it toward that situation. Sometimes people, again, who have the most time and money are the most miserly with both. But I've seen people who don't have a minute to spare, spare an hour, because that's just who they are. That's just how they are. A graceless life is so selfish, and a grace-filled life is so selfless. And the Macedonian church was a good example. They're like receivers of God's grace. And notice, they were still in poverty. Isn't that funny? Because again, there, there are people who would tell you, conveniently, that God's blessings equal bank account, right? 
That's what it equals. But the Macedonian church obviously had a spiritual blessing because they were blessing people spiritually and even financially out of a place of deficit. Interesting. God knows hoarding will never make anyone happy. No one's ever been the happy hoarder, right? I mean, you think about those shows, you watch them and you're like, they're very unhappy. All of the stuff hasn't made them happy. And then if someone touches any of that stuff, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, I heard an amazing story that I'll just shortcut for you the other day. But it was a lady who was a hoarder, and um, some, but her house was completely dilapidated. And a ministry went in to surprise her by fixing her house up, fixing all the destroyed stuff, everything, getting it all right, categorizing, categorizing things, um, throwing away true trash, but even storing the stuff in a, in a reasonable way and everything. She came back and started cursing them out. Ah, you know, where have you done with my house? Where's my destroyed porch that's sagging, you know, and all this stuff. And you go, what? How, how can this be? Um, but hoarding will never make someone happy. It's more blessed to give than receive, you know? And so one of the jokes that I always tell with kids, try it out on the next kid you know who tells you it's their birthday. Tell them, what'd you get me for your birthday? Just practice that phrase till it rolls off your tongue really nice. They'll say, hey, it's my birthday. I go, oh, great, what'd you get me for your birthday? And their and they're gears jam because they're like, I didn't get you anything for my birthday. It's my birthday. And I go, well... Man, you didn't get me anything last year either. And they go, it's my birthday. You're supposed to give me stuff. And I say, no, Jesus said it's more blessed to give than receive. And I want you to be blessed on your birthday. So you're supposed to give me something. What you go, you know, come show me what you got. And they're like, get away from me and everything. But I, I love doing that to, to people because it's such a funny thought. You know, what did you get me for your birthday? See, freed from greed and follow through, giving follows getting. I think about this so often, you know, and, and, and there's times in life where the greatest grace, as, as I've grown older, truthfully, my, my biggest joy on Christmas isn't what I got. It really isn't. It's seeing anybody who is excited about something they got. That, to me, is a far better worth than anything else. And so I think about this, verse 3, it says, I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and fellowship of the ministering of the saints. See, this is awesome because he talks about it in verse 4, imploring us with much urgency. Now, we all know what it is to have someone beg from us. And again, you know, I try to treat all people with some degree of respect where, regardless of where they are in life. But, you know, nobody really likes people coming up to you and begging from you. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's a very awkward situation. But these guys were begging Paul to give. Paul, please let us give. And he's like, no, you know, you guys, that's, come on, that's your last bagel. And he's like, give it to him. Give him my last bagel. And they're like, no, do you eat it? And he says, I'm telling you, take the bagel. And they're begging him to do it. I love it because Paul's not pressuring them to give. They're pressuring Paul to give. They're like, I want to give. I must. Pretty please, Paul, take it, we insist. And you know, you look at this, it's a work of God's grace when someone is willing, willing, and it comes from them. Again, this is one of the reasons I do so little discussion of this in life, because I'm kind of like, you know what? If someone's willing, they'll find a way, right? Where there's a will, there's a way. If somebody wants to give, uh, there's so many options, uh, I can't even think of them all. Um, and you wouldn't normally hear me talk about this stuff, but I think it's worth doing because you might not even know. I mean, again, generosity, is it just on the sign? No, Lynn knows we, we like to give things away. I, people will end up talking to me and I'm like, well, here, you can have it. I'll just go get another one. Um, people say, where did you get that? And I go, well, here, just take it. Yeah, I'll go get another one. Um, because I've been, I actually enjoy that. It makes me happier. Uh, you know, the other day there was somebody who said, that's a really cool capo. How do you do that with the guitar? I'm like, here, take it. It's easier for me to just give it to you than to find out and, and give you the link and do all that stuff. So uh, that's why I don't have a capo right now. But I'll get one. I'll get one. Don't worry. Um, but, but anyway, I'm saying that to say just... Am I saying that because it's cool? No, I'm saying you have, I couldn't even begin to outgive what God has done in our life. I was thinking about it the other day. I'm like, I, I'm way behind on the giving thing with God. I mean, he has over and abundantly done so many crazy things in my life. We have wanted for nothing. And I think about this. 
Paul isn't pressuring them. They're pressuring him. Reminds me of Mark 12. The widow's might, you know this story, but it's such a great one because the people were giving out their plenty and Jesus, uh, they were even saying, whoa, that's like, whoa, we got a big donation, you know, is what uh, the, the apostles were thinking. They're thinking like, that, look at that guy. He's dumping buckets and buckets into the bucket. And then Jesus said, eh, you know, kind of yawning through that part. And then a lady gives in two coins and Jesus wakes up and says, now that's a big gift. And again, what is he saying? He's saying the willingness behind it has so much more to do with an amount. And that's why in my life, I've never actually been a person to recognize, quote unquote, big gifts in a big way. Uh, I, again, I've been part of organizations. I'm all for thank yous. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm all for gratitude. But I know places that, hey, if you give a big gift, you get your name on the, on the building. And you go, well, what is a big gift? Well, I don't know. God knows what a big gift is. I look at it and go, $10 million was given to the such and so library. I'm like, whoa, that's huge. You know, but maybe the $20 somebody gave for a person's lunch is more significant to them than the $10 million that was given out of a bunch. And that's what Jesus was saying as a principle. What is a big gift? Every gift's a big gift if it's given with love. I remember several years ago how God just, God has, believe me, busted these ideas into my brain so hard that uh, there's no way for me to run from them, even if I tried. But I remember... After a service, there was a time after a service, and you know, pastors get tired too, and I was after uh, actually two services, and a, a, a guy rode up on a bicycle. He's a guy I know today, and my family knows who I'm talking about, but he, he rode up on a bicycle, and he was dirty, very dirty. He was, it basically, he was a guy, a homeless guy in our town. Um, he would ride around on his bike with no shirt and just howl at the moon on drugs and everything. I mean, he was way out, but he had gotten... Things were turning around a little bit for him. And he, and he pulled up. He pulled up in this bicycle right after the service, and we were surrounded by people. And he came up to somebody and said, hey, can I speak with the pastor? And I was like, oh, no, no, oh, no, I don't, want to, I don't want this. I want to go to lunch, right? You know, I really want to go to lunch. And people pointed at me and said, that's him over there. <laughs> and, I, you know, and, and this is one of the reasons I think God made me a pastor, because I was such a disaster that I needed to be a pastor to learn these things. But I, I was all ready to hear his sad story and to, you know, give him some money for lunch or give him something. And this is what he said. He said, uh, Pastor can you receive an offering for the Lord? Is it too late for me to give? I wasn't at the service. And I'm like, uh, and he pulled, seriously, he pulled out, you know, change out of his pocket and counted out 88 cents and said, it isn't, it isn't much, but it's a tithe from the, the lawn that I mowed. And I'm like, I, I didn't want to take it but I didn't want to not take it. You know what I'm saying? It's the Macedonian principle right here where they're like, please take it. And I'm like, wow. And I put it, I, I put it in our little box and I'm telling you, that might be the biggest gift any ministry I've ever been involved with has ever gotten. I was sitting there when a guy wrote a $1 million check to Miami church and it didn't impact me as much as that one did. I'm like, i would never been the same from that. When I look at 88 cents spent, I'm like, this, this is Kurt's 88 cents. This is 88 cents. I mean, I, you know, it, and people, oh, it's just a buck. It doesn't, it, it's, it's his money, right? And I vowed to the Lord that I would try to treat it like that from there on. Said, you know, big money, small money. It's the principle behind it. And something God, you know, did in my life through that is to, is to change my mind from thinking, you know, that you should never receive something from someone who has less than somebody else, right? That, that well, you seek out the people who have surplus. God is, is doing this in anyone's life. And the, the joy on that guy's face to be able to contribute to the work of God. I've never seen someone brighten up so much out of, out of giving. Like, you know, whenever I think of God loves a cheerful giver, the guy went away happy, happy, happy from his 88 cents. And Scott went home and repented of his mentality. 
deep poverty, difficult trials, it's an abundance of joy. It seems strange, but this is the follow through. Again, it's like, how can something done afterwards bring greater joy than something done before? How can it be the consistency of that? And I think about this, God has shown us so many ways. Even before we had kids, you know, in the early 90s, I think this one was very dramatic in our life. We moved to Miami and and uh, we didn't have kids yet, and Lynn was uh, applying for different jobs in the area and stuff, but she actually volunteered as a crossing guard in our little town. We had a little part of Miami that was kind of cute, like Davidson here, called Miami Springs, and there was a little crossing guard position that was volunteer, and she said, well, I'll do that, you know, while I'm looking. And so one of the things that I remember her coming home from that at, at various times, and I'd talk about work, and she'd talk about this thing, that she'd see fancy cars, and fancy clothes and people in these cars in a hurry to school dropping their kids off and their kid would get out without even a kiss half the time it was you know someone doing this in the mirror and the kids running off and and all the rest and then she would see these certain cars there were like one or two the one that was stuck in memory that was just like barely going like and all you know paint all faded and everything more kids stuffed into it than were probably legal and everything else. And everybody got a kiss and a hug before they got out. Everybody, you know, was ready for school. And I love you, Ma. I love you, too. You know, and all that. And we were like, no amount of money makes up for this. And so many parents, my, ourselves included, might have fallen into the trap of, I want my kids to have everything. I want them to, that's why we're doing this. We're sacrificing for them. And you go, well, I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes the follow through is, you know, <laughs> there's abundant joy without all the abundance of things. Now, am I romanticizing poverty? Nope. I've been close to it in so many ways. I've traveled a lot. Uh, third world and all the rest, some even here in the United States. And you know what? Poverty is, is painful. There's nothing beautiful about it. But the beauty that God can do is that sometimes someone who doesn't have anything has a lot. And many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so when you think about this, verse 5, it says, Not only had we hoped, not only as we'd hoped, they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. You were waiting, I know, for principle number two because we can't get to principle number four without principle number two. And I promise I'm going to follow through on my promise to step on the gas and get done in our normal time. But principle number two, loving others follows loving God. This one's huge. This one is massive. Again, forget about money for a minute. And uh, think about this. Loving others follows loving God. If I say, hey, I, I really love God, I'm, really, I, I'm, a, I'm a godly person, I care a lot about God, okay, well, follow through with that and love others because that's what Jesus repeatedly said. What he said to Peter when Peter said, I love you, Jesus, he said, I believe you, now go love people in my name. God doesn't need anything. He really doesn't. He's not broke. He's not short of friends. He's, he's not you know, feeling lonely right now. He, he's, he doesn't have the needs that people have. So he's like, you love me? Show it. Show it to someone who doesn't feel it. Someone who doesn't know it. Love the lost. That's an important one. But you know what? Love the found. I put that in quotes because found people get lost too. I think some of the saddest people sometimes are believers who don't believe that God cares about them anymore, you know, and, and haven't heard from him lately because they haven't heard from someone lately. And I think about this, I do a lot of relationship counsel, you know, and, and I have over the years. And it, you know what? This is what I've learned. It's, it's so good that I did it because I needed it, right? I, I think back to it and I think all of those times when I was sitting talking with somebody about what they needed, I was really talking to myself about what I needed. And, and I think about that and, and when I think back about what it is to... Uh, rejoice sometimes in some of the relationship grace that God has showed our family. Some of it has been through the fact that I sat down day after day after day and told people, here are the important priorities in life. And God would say, Scott, are those your important priorities in life? I'm like, well, by the fifth session, I ought to be, they only got one session. I got five that day. I'm a slow learner, but hopefully I learned something. And this was it, that loving others follows loving God. And I used to have an illustration, I still use it, which is the horizontal and the vertical axis, which is when life gets all wobbly and relationships are all over the place, you know what you have to do? You can't just fix 
the horizontal, you have to look first at the vertical axis and say, how's my relationship with God? Is it, is it what it needs to be? And if it is what it needs to be, it's amazing how that stabilizes even the most crazy of relationships on this side. Because oftentimes I could trace back to the fact that, you know, when somebody gets distance from their relationship with God, well, it's no shock or surprise that that has shockwaves through other relationships they have because really it's pretty easy to love God. I mean, come on. Um, it is. He's very lovable. Um, I think God is tremendously lovable. What's not to love? What's not to like? But you know what? People are much harder. So the thing is, loving others follows from loving God. From loving Him and being loved of Him gives us the resource with which to love others. That's what it's supposed to be about. Remember what Paul said about the Macedonians? They were freely, live, freely willing even beyond their ability. That was verse 3. Um, more concerned about others than they were about themselves. They weren't thinking, well, uh, you know, I was really hoping to upgrade this, this year. You know, they were thinking, no, I, I, but I, I, can't, I can't be at peace if I know there's people with problems. How can that happen? Well, again, I think it's that secret in verse 5. If you want to know the practical secret, you know, what is the coaching tip there? It says, they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us. It doesn't say they gave themselves to everybody and whatever was left over, they gave that to the Lord. Time, energy, and everything else. I think about this again. Um, energy spent with the Lord will give you more energy to spend with others. Time spent with God will give you a capacity to have more quality time with other people, right? They fell in love with God first and they followed through and loved others. And if you get this in the wrong order, and I know I have, and I know you will, and I probably will again, and so will you, but if you'll know it, how will you know it? You know, athletes know there's, that my, my jumper's broke. Why is it broke? Well, they go back with a coach so often. A professional athlete will have a coach who's not as good as they are, but they, they'll tell them, oh man, you're choking your stroke right there. Right there, you're, you're, you stopped following through you know you're not bending your wrist down at the end you're like how does that matter well it matters <laughs> watch your shooting percentage and so you'll burn out this is how you know you'll burn out how do you know a person who has tried to love people without first having the love of God flowing through their life they'll burn out Trying to accomplish God's work but not giving themselves to God first is a very exhausting thing because people are exhausting. Man, are people frustrating. Man, you think about this again. This is not just a pastor's thought. This is a person thought. I mean, our uh, daughter there is, is a nurse. And you know what? So often I, I, I say well, you, you can't just love sick people, right? If you do that, you'll burn out. Right? Everybody knows this, that people who care too much and carry too much can't keep doing it. Why? Because you, you have to have that care first flow through that person. If, if people give themselves first to God, then the priorities will take care of themselves, and God will give us what we need to take care of others. And in this next section, you see verse 6 moves from the example of Macedonia back to Corinth. And Paul there in verse 6 is talking about something he told to Titus. He's telling the people in this letter, hey, Titus and I had a conversation and here's what I told Titus. It wasn't about money again. It was about something more important than that. It was talking about the actual implementation of a plan, a plan to help, right? Not just a bucket of money with no idea what to do with it. One of the leaders in, in Corinth, Titus, this is what he says. Look at verse 6. He says, as Titus begun so he would complete. Do you see how this entire chapter is all about follow through? It's easy to begin things. It's hard to complete stuff. It's so easy to start something. It's so hard to end well. See, I've thought about it even with my own life. Um, I, I thought about this so many times. It's part of my overriding obsession sort of with my life right now, which is I started the Christian life pretty well. I even ran it pretty well. The big question is, will I end it well? Um, will, I, will I finish well? Because, you know, Paul was, was proud of his finish, um, proud and, in in a, you know, pleased with his finish. Uh, he, he, was, he was glad that he had finished the way he did. There's so many people who, who begin well, and they're like, oh, man, 
And I remember somebody saying the difference between an airplane is it takes off, it goes, and it lands. And you always want takeoffs and landings to match, right? Same number of each. Um, but I, I know people who are like rockets. <laughs> no landing on that one. And you go, I don't want that for my life. I don't care how high you fly, if you don't land well, if you don't live well all the way through, man, there's, there's kind of like an asterisk around it. I think of all the professional athletes who have an asterisk after their name and don't get into the Hall of Fame because they didn't finish well. They, man, they started well. Verse 6, he says, So we urged Titus as he had begun, so he would complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in diligence, in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also, see the church in Corinth was well known for its its wealth. Um, it was a prosperous place. It was a seaport. It was business savvy, right? I mean, they were really, really good at a lot of things, and it was famous for abounding. I mean, there was any if you wanted it, it was in Corinth, right? You go, well, man, where would I get that? Well, check Corinth. I'm sure they have it. They probably have 17 different varieties of it. You know, whatever it was, that was Corinth, and so they were like. We, you know, all the time, swinging from the rafters. And they were very, very spiritual. You may remember that back to 1 Corinthians. And if you didn't believe them, you, all you had to do was watch them. Oh, man, they had every supernatural gift you could want, even ones you wouldn't want. I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff. He says, you're abounding in everything. How about if you abound with following through? Oh, well, that one's tough. That one takes discipline. <laughs> that one takes more than an emotional moment. That, that takes moments of motion and discipline and careful diligence. This is what he talks about. He says, you guys, you guys talk like crazy. You guys are amazing speech writers. Follow through. Like, that was a tremendous campaign. Follow through. See, and I love this because the fullness of the Spirit is best demonstrated by follow through all the way through not just promises not just amazing speeches not just talking in tongues and wow this is what a service i might wait whoo the hairs on my arms stood up in that the spirit really moved and you go okay what did you do afterwards nothing what'd you do different nada uh, and you think about this verse 8 he says i don't speak by commandment i'm testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence diligence of others he's saying the standard is out there the type of thing that is uh out there there's plenty of great examples again he's he's not trying to you know shame them as much as he's saying look man <laughs> you want to know what grace and love look like it, it looks like a walk that matches the talk. That's what it looks like, the diligence of others. I've seen others not just promise to love, I've seen them follow through and do what love does, right? You want to look at that example? There's the example. And I love this because there's definitely a connection between loving and giving, right? And I'm again, not just money, time, effort, energy, emotion to these things. There's nothing to make a guy start spending money like falling in love. Man, I, you could watch their bank account. Whoa, what are you doing? Well, um, spending money. Why are you doing that? And I think about this. My wife didn't marry me for money. If she did, she made a horrible mistake. Uh, she, she didn't count right or something. But what if I was constantly saying the words of love, right? But I just simply wouldn't spend a dime on her. I make her walk everywhere because, hey, gas is expensive, you know. Um, it, it's hot in the car, but, hey, turn the air conditioner off, you know. We don't want to waste that sort of thing. And at home, you know, all that kind of never take her out for food, no money for groceries, uh, no time or energy spent, uh, even more than money. But then you go out in my well air conditioned garage and nothing but the best for my VW van, right? <laughs> Climate control, newest accessories, gifts for it, you know, all that sort of thing. You say, I think she, I think Scott may be in love with Daisy. I think something's wrong, you know, here. Because again, words are cheap, right? Words are cheap. But actions speak louder. And the proof of sincerity is not just an emotion, but emotion that follows it, right? And I've, I've been in so many board meetings, uh, you know, board in board meetings, which is why they call them that. And at the end of some things, you go, is there a motion? Which is what? There's, maybe you've been in those things where everyone thinks because we discussed something, we've done something. And you're like, 
who's going to do something? Is there an action item <laughs> that we're going to do? Oh, well, nobody wants to go on record for that. No, I motion that we change this. And does anyone second it and are all in favor? And are we going to implement it starting Monday, right? That's a way different thing than meetings that people just talk. And so this is what he's saying. Do you love God? Then follow through. Love others. And look at verse 9. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was rich for your sakes. He became poor that through his poverty you might become rich. What an incredible turnaround this was. It basically says the grace of Jesus is this. He had everything and he gave it to you, and you had nothing, and you gave it to him. That was the gift exchange, right? He was poor physically. Don't let anyone tell you any different. He borrowed things everywhere he went. He's the only guy I know who borrowed a tomb because he only needed it for the weekend, right? I, I'm like, hey, I'm, I, I'm just staying like Airbnb. I really not not a long term thing, you know. Most of us like we'd go, okay, I need a little longer than that. But, you know, he borrowed a coin to prove a point. Who has a, Does anyone have a coin here? Um, he didn't say, oh, here, I've got all I got's bills, you know, that sort of thing. It, none of that silliness. He borrowed all kinds of things. But he took our sin and he became spiritually poor, right? On, on the, that great exchange, it's like, how did he end up with the sin of the world on him? And how did I end up with the grace of God on me? Well, that's the emphasis of the Old Testament is that it talks in, in pictures, you know, of, of God's blessings and God's pour, pouring things out and, and all that. And there were all these physical examples of that. But in the, in the New Testament, the emphasis is spiritual and we can never forget this because otherwise we just make totally bad interpretations of the Bible. Ephesians 1, 3 says, God blesses with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. That doesn't mean you're going to have every earthly blessing uh, because you know what? Physical blessings can sure turn to physical stressings pretty quick. Um, you know, having a lot uh, has a lot of problems that go with it too. And so he says it not by command. He says, I say it to your advantage. Just follow through. Look at verse 10. He says, in this I give advice. I love it because it's just coaching. He says, advice. It's to your advantage, not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you must also complete the doing of it, that there was a readiness to desire to do it. There should be a completion out of what you have. Verse uh, 11 there talks about completion. This is principle number three. I put doing follows willing. Doing follows willing. Um, if you're not willing, you won't be doing for very long, right? But willing is an incredibly important th thing. Um, I... Willingness, when I think of myself as a teacher in a school, if you give me a kid who's willing, I know they will do all kinds of things. But getting them to be willing, I can even get them to do some stuff. Unwilling, you know. But to do something willingly and to follow through from the beginning to the end, not just to start it. Yeah, I'll start. I, I really want to do better on the next test. And it, well, you could, you could do this worksheet. No, I don't want to do it. Um, I did the first two and then I didn't do the rest. See, being willing is no substitute for doing, but there'll be no doing if there's no willing, not for long. And the Corinthians had made all kinds of promises and then time had passed and their commitment waned. And I don't know about you, but this is a, a human condition. This happens to me. I, I'll have something that I am so committed to and then in week two, I am committed to it. And in week three, I am thinking about it occasionally. And in week four, I'm like, gave up on that, you know? One of these days I'm going to do it, and it's just not a great time. And I talked with a friend who had run a marathon recently, and this is what they told me. It was an act of the will to finish. They said it was, it was an act of whimsy to start. They were like, yeah, I think I'll do it. Um, it was pretty easy to start. He said, it was the hardest thing I have ever done to finish. Uh, they said, I, I, I'm going to try it again. <laughs> because they were like, you know, it was just such an amazing thing to do. But and they just said, I had to will every step at the last part. So easy to start. So hard to finish. And you think about this. Many start in their heart with something in life, but they don't finish with their feet. You know, there's no follow through. And this is Paul's personal advice. He says, just, just complete it. If you're going to do it, if you're going to say you're going to do it, do it. And that's why, for me, one of my catchphrases is under promise and over deliver. Uh, under promise and over deliver. People always ask me things like, hey, will you be there? And I'm like, I will make every effort to be there. But I never tell someone I'll be there if I don't know I'll be there. 
there's times where I, hey, can you be at this? Um, I will, I will try, uh, but I won't say, you can count on me. Why? Because I can't always count on things. I don't know whether I'll be there or not. It's so easy to say yes to everyone. And if you do, you end up saying no to everyone else <laughs> in the process. You even say no to yourself. You say no to God. You say no to everything because yes, it's easy. Uh, yeah, I'll do that. I'm going to start a whole bunch of stuff in the new year. And I think about, you know, whether it's being a friend to somebody or a parent. I, I've tried with my kids not to promise things I won't do. There have been a handful of times where I told them we'd do something and I just couldn't get it done. But for the most part, if I said, look, I'm going to do it, then I'm going to do it. And as we'll see, the Corinthians had good intentions when it came to giving. They said, we'll do it. But that was way back in 1 Corinthians 16. And Paul let them know about a need. And they said, yeah, hey, have you heard anything more about that need? Yeah, I already spent the money. I, I pledged it to Paul, but I pledged it to 14 other people actually in the meantime too because you know there was a legitimate need, a great opportunity. And, and you know this, opportunities abound. They made promises, you can count on me, but time passed and there was no follow through, no completion, no action. The indication the Corinthians had, you know, an initial enthusiasm, but got busy. They just simply got busy. It wasn't a bad reason. It just, hey, I got too busy and they got occupied and life got in the way and it does that, you know, and this is what Jesus said about the three soils, a life that didn't follow through. It wasn't that it was a life that was lost. It just lost some of its potential. And this is Mark 14, uh, Mark 4, 19. If you think about it, maybe you know the parable, but it was four different soils. And he said, there was a soil that, this is the problem, it, it didn't bring full fruit. Why? Because it said the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things entered and choked it out. It just kind of like, wow, those are three important things. The cares of the world. Got any cares of the world? Got anything you got to think about? Of course you do. Got deceitfulness of riches? It was like, just a little more will make enough, you know? And the desires for other things. You go, well, I did pledge Paul, but wow, did you see that deal they had on Black Friday? Oh, well, well. Um, you know, uh, sorry, Paul, I spent it. And this is what he says. You won't reach your full potential if you can't promise something and practice it. Look at verse 12. Again, money, that's the least of the things he's talking about. Life. Verse 12, if there's first a willing mind, it's accepted according to what one has and not according to what they don't have. That's such a great verse. I, I remember freeing a family with that verse. There was somebody who was under such tremendous guilt that they couldn't help with something. I mean, they were just crushed that they couldn't help. And I took them to this exact verse and I said, God sees you're wanting to, not, he doesn't see the amount. It's accepted according to what you have, not according to what you don't have. And they were like, Wow. So I said, guess what? You get credit for wanting to do it. <laughs> um, verse 13, I, I don't mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance might su supply their lack, and their abundance may also supply your lack, that there might be equality. For it's written, he who gathered much had nothing left, he who has gathered little had no lack. I love this thought as we kind of bring it to a, a roaring close here, because... Um, trying to follow through. Paul, Paul says, <laughs> I'm not trying to rob Peter to pay, pay Paul, right? <laughs> I'm not trying to rob Macedonia to pay Jerusalem. I, he said, isn't it funny how one person's up one time and down another? There are people who have helped me when I was down and I've helped them when they were down. I've been unemployed, they've been unemployed. And, and it wasn't just that he wanted everyone to be unemployed and nobody to have anything. He was just kind of like, you know what? It's amazing how if you live a generous life, you might find that there's people who are generous with you when you have your need too. And it's really easy to overcorrect. Every coach knows that. You know, you tell them to follow through and all of a sudden the guy's like falling on the ground, following through. And he's like, no, 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 no. I knew a, a situation, this one was super grievous, but... Uh, a pastor include, uh, encouraged his people to, uh, to take out loans so that the church wouldn't have to take out a loan. Uh, it wasn't a church I was directly involved with, but they, they actually took out home mortgages, second mortgages, to give to the church for a building project. Well, the building project fell through, the people fell through, and there were people with decades of debt as a result of this. Please don't ever, ever do something that is that unbiblical. That is so unbiblical. Oh, I would hate to be that pastor before the Lord. But uh, I'd hate to be him in front of the people too. If they ever found him again, they were going to let him know what they thought of that. 
But the quote is from the Old Testament. It's about manna. It basically said you gather. And guess what? What was weird about manna is it, it spoiled if you piled it up too much. God's kind of like, you know, gather enough. And if you look down and go, wow, I can't eat all this, give it to the person next to you. Because tomorrow they may be the one with the overflowing bucket and you'll go, ooh, I didn't get not such a good day on manna today. And you know what? It's amazing how generous people know generous people. But, you know, I think about it with candy and pinatas and all that. There were always those kids who would just hoard, blah, you know, and they were bucket blowing over and stuff like that. And there'd be the little kid who was crying because they didn't get any. And you're like, as a parent, I wasn't saying take, you don't get any candy. It was like, please just, how much candy can one person eat without incurring all kinds of bills on other sides? So verse 16, he says, thanks be to God who puts the same earnest care for you in the heart of Titus. For he not only accepted the exhortation, but being more diligent, he went to you of his own accord. So he drove a Honda, in case you are wondering. Um, and verse 18, we have spent with him the brother, sent with him the brother, whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. Verse 19 to 21, he says, Not only that, who is also chosen by the churches to travel with us with this gift, which is administered by us to the glory of God himself, and to show your ready mind, Avoiding this, that anyone would blame us in this lavish gift which is administered by us, providing honorable things not only in the sight of the Lord, but in the sight of men. Last principle, principle four, responsibility follows opportunity. I could reverse it again and say opportunity follows responsibility. They do. They're circular. But responsibility comes with opportunity. If God gives you an opportunity, there's a responsibility shrink-wrapped with that. God gave them an amazing opportunity here, but they had a responsibility too, and he talks about it. He says, Titus, he traveled not alone, but he went with people chosen by the church. There were people who they chose him. Now, who do you think they chose? If they're like, okay, we got a, a long journey with a lot of money, who should we give it to? Well, let's see. There's this guy over here who's like wanted for fraud in three counties and you know money flows through his hand to himself every time he does anything you go I don't think they'd choose that person right because responsibility follows opportunity if you're faithful with something minor like money you might be faithful with something more like real responsibility right I need to be responsible you need to be responsible this is our response to opportunity and he talks about it uh, as the chapter finishes out, verse 22, he said, We have sent them with our brother whom we have proved diligent in many things. How do you get proved diligent? A past record of no past record. <laughs> but now much more diligent because of the great confidence which we have in you. If anyone inquires about Titus, he's my partner and fellow worker concerning you. If our brethren are inquired about, they are the messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. Therefore, show to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. In other words, Paul says, don't make me a liar, guys. <laughs> I, I would love to follow through, but I, I can only follow through on my promises if you follow through on yours. And he's vouching for the financial faithfulness, but more than that, the personal integrity of people like Titus and others who will be involved in this process. And they were known to follow through. They were often proved diligent. And it's never too late to start getting a new trajectory in your life. If, if there's areas where you say, well, you know what? I think I'm going to just take a single homework assignment and please do follow through. Don't, you know, if you're going to do it, say you're going to do it. Take this home and think on it and say, is there something I have said I was going to do and I didn't do it? Or I started to do it and I didn't finish it. Or I, it got difficult and I, and I decided, nah, I'm not going to do it. Uh, the true test of anything is, is to go through the tests, right? And to follow through to the finish. And this was a, a great lesson from my life. It's the final illustration. But we, we had a, a bathroom remodel once. Um, but you know how it started? It started very simply. There was a guy who came over to our house for dinner and he happened to look up and kind of like there is right here, like see that little stain around the thing? He, he looked up and he said, is that new? Uh, the, the stain, I said, I never noticed it. He said, you have a leak. I said, that looks fresh. And so, I said, well, after dinner, we went upstairs and he poked at a little tile on the shower and it pushed right through. It, like, it, had, it had water underneath it that I hadn't noticed. And he was a, a Mr. Fix-It kind of guy. And so he's like, uh, you got to fix this. 
Uh, he said, don't just, don't just cover it up. It's, there's a problem underneath. We got to pull it all the way out. And uh, he, he said, I'll help you. And he did. He did exactly what he said he would do. He followed through. He didn't just say, yeah, I'll come sometime and do it. No, he came over and he was an extremely busy guy. And somehow he found a way to get over there and he helped me pull it all out. And he taught me all kinds of things about bathrooms, which include, I never want to do another bathroom uh, <laughs> thing. Why? Because it's easy to start it and it's difficult to finish it. Um, I think what I would like to do next time is write a check at the start and, uh, you know, as a deposit. And if, uh, when it's done, I'll write them a check when they follow through. Why? Because it's super hard. Again, sometimes it's easier to write a check than it is to do the work yourself because it is rough. So anyway, I think about that and I go, I, I'm so glad for somebody who actually finished it all the way through to its completion. You know, and I think about that, how important that is. It was very discouraging along the way. And so Paul's just simply saying, hey, follow through. Follow through as a parent. If you made promises as a parent, it's easy to, to at the early stages of it, on some level, we should have kids. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds fun. Um, you know, but 20 years later, ooh, we still have kids. <laughs> we got to follow through, you know. <laughs> the, yeah, all those things. Let's get a puppy. Yes. <laughs> What are we going to do with this old dog? Well, we're going to follow through, right? It's hard to follow through. But that's what Paul was saying. In life, let's follow through. Thank you, Lord, for all of these thoughts. Pray that you would keep them ever before us, uh, that we would know where to look in the Scripture to see them, and we would see beyond, again, just uh, something that has to do with dollars and cents, but it makes so much sense to know that we have to follow through. We can't just do things halfway. And so I pray that we, you would give each one of us that thing, that one thing maybe that we could make a difference in this week simply by putting a do to the willingness. And uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.